throughout the Higher Geography course, you will have been introduced to a variety of geographical skills that are assessed in both the assignment and the exam. Research skills, like gathering and processing techniques, and the ability to evaluate and interpret data gathered, are assessed in the assignment and will not be covered in this video. In the exam, you'll be assessed on your ability to interpret maps, graphs and numerical data. And that's what I'm going to cover in this video. Ordnance survey maps will only feature in the application of geographical skills question at the end of the exam. You should be able to give map evidence using four and six figure grid references or with reference to named features. When giving a grid reference, you must refer to the Eastings first, followed by the Northings. Be as accurate as you can and pinpoint the middle of any feature. You should be able to calculate distance on both 1 to 50,000 scale maps and 1 to 25,000 scale maps. On both of these maps, one grid square is equal to one kilometre, so half a grid square would be 500 metres. But there will always be a scale bar on the map for you to refer to. Interpreting the shape of the land is more tricky. Height is shown using contour lines, which are brown lines on the map. This gives an indication of the gradient of slopes. Contour lines that are closer together are a lot steeper, and contour lines that are further apart are more gentle. Also look out for spot heights. These tell you the height of an individual position and are often found at the top of a hill or on areas of flat land. A triangulation pillar or trig point is marked as a blue triangle with a dot in the middle. Contour lines also show aspect, which is the direction a slope is facing and it can be important to refer to this. This slope here, you can see, goes from 500 metres at the top to less than 100 metres at the bottom, and that shows that it's facing in a southwest direction. You will always have a key to explain what symbols mean, but it's worth learning some of these to speed up your work. You also need to understand the relevance of these for any question that you're asked about. You could be asked to interpret a cross-section between two points on the map. It's useful to have a pencil so that you can draw lightly the line on the map. Cross-sections are always drawn to scale, so you just need to measure distances along the map and match that up with the cross-section. You should be able to relate an ordnance survey map to other pieces of information like field sketches, photographs, cross-sections and transects. Again, this would only be in the application of geographical skills section. Different kinds of maps can feature in other parts of the exam and you need to be able to extract and interpret information depending on the topic that you're writing about. Graphical information can feature throughout the exam but often require specific terminology or skills in their interpretation. The first graph here is a storm hydrograph, and an explanation of how to deal with this can be found in the hydrosphere video. Population pyramids, like the second graph here, similarly require an understanding of the topic in their interpretation. Sometimes questions require you to comment on patterns, and in this third graph, there are clear peaks and troughs at certain times of day. It is important to pick these specific values out and consider the consequences of these. Data can also be presented in tables or written as statistics. And sometimes there is an expectation to make reference to these numbers in an answer. In this table, the statistics about Ethiopia can be used to help justify the need for water management in the river basin management topic. The statistics here are about malaria and they're just a prompt in a development and health question. So to focus in on the application of geographical skills questions. In the examples here, they've always followed the same format. A proposed development, and you'll be provided with an ordnance survey map and other information. No matter what the development, candidates have been asked to discuss two things. 
First, the site, route or location of the proposed development. Secondly, the impacts this development may have on the surrounding area, often specifying social, economic and environmental impacts. The question is worth 20 marks in total across two aspects. When commenting on the site, it's important to cover both benefits and problems. You need to bring in map evidence, including grid references and values. Make sure you also refer to other graphs and diagrams, quoting figures because marks will be allocated for that. Your answer should be specific to the scenario given, so avoid rote learned generic answers. Almost any development will need to consider relief, not just the altitude that can influence temperature and rainfall, but probably more importantly, gradient. Steeper slopes make any kind of construction more challenging and therefore more expensive due to the need for earthworks and the risk of mass movements. Flatter land will be more straightforward to build on, but has the increased risk of flooding. Aspect may also be important with south-facing slopes in the UK receiving more sunshine and east-facing slopes being more sheltered from the prevailing westerly winds. Another factor is drainage, not just linked to the shape of the land, but also distance from water sources. Don't just say water is near or far, give a distance in metres or kilometres. Consider whether your site is on the same level as the water or how much higher it is. If this is an issue, what might need to be done to protect your site? For land use, never say there is nothing there. Give the most likely current land use using map evidence and consider whether this is greenfield or brownfield. Both categories come with benefits and problems and these should be emphasised, linking to the type of development asked for. Access will also be important, whatever the scenario either during construction or for the running of the development. How much infrastructure will need to be built? You should give a distance for this. What kind of road does it link to? Is this large enough? What about public or other sustainable forms of transport providing access, perhaps for customers or for workers? If I was to compare these two sites here, both of them are within 100 metres of a water source. But the flood risk for B is much greater than for A, because A is more than 20 metres higher than the reservoir, whilst B is at the same height as the river. Both sites are greenfield, but A would require removing a non-coniferous woodland, so less likely to be granted planning permission. The road access for B is better because it is within 100 metres of a main road, with a roundabout already in place. The road in A is a secondary road, so less suitable for increased traffic and is over 500 metres from the site, increasing the cost of connection. If asked to discuss impacts, again, you should focus on both benefits and problems, and you should cover social, economic and environmental ones. No matter what the development, consider whether it will impact locally on pollution, but make sure you specify, is this water pollution, noise pollution or air pollution? If so, would that potentially impact the health of the local population? That would be a social impact. Would it cost a lot to clean up afterwards, an economic impact? Or would it damage habitats for wildlife, an environmental impact? Your development may actually reduce pollution, in which case the impacts would be beneficial, but covering the same reasons. If referring to habitats, don't just talk generally. Link to specific examples from the map giving grid references or names. Consider as well aspects of the built environment that may be lost, like historical buildings or ancient sites. Most answers will include reference to jobs. But to really demonstrate your understanding, link this to any statistics given, if possible, and be specific about what kind of jobs and during which phase of development. Again, this can bring social benefits as well as the more obvious economic ones. 
Will the development have an impact on flood risk in the area? Whenever possible, you can demonstrate your understanding of other parts of the higher course. In this case, hydrosphere and the consequences for the movement of water if introducing artificial impermeable surfaces. And don't stop there. What might be the knock-on effects of a flood event on mental health, that's a social impact, and insurance prices, an economic impact? Will the development encourage a change in population? What would be the consequences of this for local businesses? Will this impact on levels of traffic? Again, don't just stop there. What are the knock-on effects of this? The way to pick up a lot of marks in an application of geographical skills question is to make sure you refer to all of the information given. Make sure your answer refers to the scenario provided and expand on each one of your points, considering knock-on effects and the social, economic and environmental consequences. Music